Picture this. The year is 1187 and the Muslim forces led by the formidable Saladin have recaptured Jerusalem. This monumental event sends shockwaves through the Christian world, as the holy city once under Christian control, falls back into Muslim hands. It's a devastating loss, one that stirs the hearts and spirits of Christians across Europe. In the wake of this loss, Pope Gregory VIII issues a passionate call to arms. His words echo throughout the kingdoms, igniting a fervor and determination to reclaim Jerusalem. This call sparks the initiation of the Third Crusade, one of the most significant chapters in the annals of history. Three key players emerge during this time, King Richard the Lionheart of England with his unyielding courage, King Philip II of France a strategic mind, and Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire, a seasoned warrior. So with Jerusalem in Muslim hands, and the Christian world in shock, the stage was set for the Third Crusade. Three mighty leaders, three massive armies, one common goal, the recapture of Jerusalem. Our tale begins with the departure of these formidable forces. From the west, King Richard the Lionheart of England, known for his courage and prowess in battle. From the heart of Europe, King Philip II of France, a monarch of strategic cunning and diplomatic skill. And from the east, Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, the seasoned warrior of the Holy Roman Empire, his age and wisdom unmatched. The journey was not without its perils. From the start, the Crusaders had to grapple with the elements, the rough terrain, and the constant threat of enemy attacks. Supplies ran low, morale wavered, but through it all, their resolve remained unshaken. The most tragic of these hardships befell the army of Emperor Frederick Barbarossa. In an unfortunate turn of events, the Emperor met his end not in the heat of battle, but in the cool waters of Salef River. It is said that while attempting to cross the river, he slipped from his horse and drowned. His abrupt demise was a heavy blow to his troops. Yet, despite the loss of their leader, they pressed on driven by the promise of their holy mission. Meanwhile the English and French forces, each facing their own set of challenges, continued their march towards the Holy Land. Richard's fleet was scattered by a storm, forcing him to regroup and reorganize. Philip on the other hand, had to contend with internal squabbles and political intrigue. Nonetheless they too persevered, their eyes firmly set on Jerusalem. After grueling months of travel, the English and French forces finally arrived in the Holy Land. They were battle-worn and weary, but their spirits remained unbroken. Their journey had been fraught with difficulties, but it was far from over. The real fight was yet to come. Despite losses and setbacks the Crusaders pressed on, their eyes set on Jerusalem. As the Crusaders arrived in the Holy Land their first major obstacle was the fortified city of Acre. The city was a strategic jewel, its stout walls a testament to its impregnability. The Crusaders faced a formidable challenge. The Siege of Acre, one of the most significant battles of the Third Crusade, began in the late summer of 1189. The Crusaders, under the leadership of Guy of Lusignan, King of Jerusalem, and later Richard the Lionheart, King of England, set up camp outside the city, determined to reclaim it. The defenders, a mix of Muslim soldiers from across the region, held steadfast, employing ingenious tactics to hold the Crusaders at bay. They launched devastating counterattacks, used flaming projectiles, and even dug tunnels to disrupt the besieging forces. Their resilience was phenomenal, but the Crusaders were determined. The Crusaders, not to be outdone, employed their own set of strategies. They constructed massive siege engines, towers of wood and metal, designed to breach the city walls. The Knights Hospitaller and the Knights Templar warrior monks led the charge, their faith driving them forward in the face of formidable resistance. The battle raged on for two long years. The scales tipped in favor of the Crusaders when reinforcements arrived in the summer of 1191, led by none other than Richard the Lionheart. His tactical brilliance and martial prowess turned the tide. By July, the city capitulated, marking a significant victory for the Crusaders. In the aftermath, Philip II of France, Richard's ally, departed for home, leaving Richard as the sole leader of the crusade. Richard consolidated his command, reorganizing his forces and preparing for the next phase of the campaign. Despite the victory the crusaders had paid a heavy price in the siege of Acre, losing many men and resources. Yet their spirits remained unbroken. With Acre under Christian control, Richard the Lionheart was now in a position to push for Jerusalem. The battle for Acre was over, but the Third Crusade was far from done. The road to Jerusalem was fraught with danger and uncertainty, but for the Crusaders the journey had just begun. 
The road to Jerusalem was fraught with battles and negotiations alike. As Richard the Lionheart and his crusader army advanced, they found themselves engaged in a crucial battle, the Battle of Arsuf. It was September 7, 1191, a day that would be seared into the annals of crusade history. Located along the Mediterranean coast, Arsuf served as a strategic location for Richard. Its capture would provide a secure coastal route for supplies and reinforcements, a lifeline for the Crusader army. The battle was fierce, a clash of steel and wills under the blazing Levantine sun, yet, Richard's disciplined forces, coupled with his tactical prowess, proved superior. The day ended with a significant Crusader victory, a morale boost for Richard's forces, and a stark reminder to Saladin of the Crusader's might. Yet, even as the echoes of battle quieted, Richard found himself in another kind of confrontation, this time not on the battlefield but across the negotiation table. Richard sought a peaceful resolution with Saladin, the formidable Muslim leader. He proposed an agreement, a marriage between his sister, Queen Joanna of Sicily, and Saladin's brother, Aladil. This union, he believed, would bring an end to the bloodshed and establish a lasting peace. However, the negotiations proved as challenging as the battles. Cultural and religious differences, deep-seated mistrust and divergent goals made the peace talks a steep uphill climb. Despite Richard's best efforts, the negotiations fell through. The prospect of a peaceful resolution, much like the city of Jerusalem, remained just out of reach. And so, the road to Jerusalem continued to be a path, marked by conflict and contention. Each victory brought them one step closer to their goal, yet the ultimate prize, the holy city of Jerusalem, remained elusive. Despite victories, the recapture of Jerusalem remained elusive. This chapter of the Third Crusade, much like the road itself, was a testament to the challenges, triumphs, and disappointments that lay in the pursuit of a deeply desired goal. As months turned into years, the Third Crusade was reaching its climax. After the grueling battles and long sieges, Richard the Lionheart, King of England, found himself at the threshold of Jerusalem. Yet he chose not to storm the city. His decision was not an easy one and it was not made lightly. He was well aware of the logistical issues that could arise from such a move. His forces were worn and battered, the supply lines were stretched thin, the risk of a counterattack from Saladin's forces was too great. Richard knew that capturing Jerusalem would not be the end. Holding the city would be another challenge altogether. He had to consider the welfare of his men, the stability of his realm back home, and the overall objective of the crusade. Richard's decision to forego the siege of Jerusalem was not a sign of defeat, but rather a strategic move, a testament to his military acumen. In the face of these obstacles, Richard did not abandon his mission. He had come too far and sacrificed too much to leave empty-handed, and so he turned to diplomacy. He engaged in negotiations with Saladin, the Muslim leader who had recaptured Jerusalem from the Christians. The result was the Treaty of Ramla, signed in the year 1192. The treaty was a compromise, a testament to the pragmatism of both leaders. It did not give Richard the prize he had initially sought, the city of Jerusalem. But it secured something arguably more valuable. The treaty allowed Christian pilgrims unfettered access to the holy city. This was a significant victory. It meant that Christians could visit their sacred sites without fear of harassment or violence. While the Third Crusade did not recapture Jerusalem, it did secure important rights for Christian pilgrims, marking a significant chapter in the annals of the Crusades. In the grand tapestry of history the Third Crusade stands out not as a tale of conquest, but as a story of resilience, strategy and compromise. The Third Crusade, a journey marked by victories, defeats and diplomatic negotiations, was a pivotal moment in history. It was a saga of courage, resilience, and determination, encapsulating the triumphs and tribulations of the Christian and Muslim worlds. From the fervent beginnings to the climactic battle for Acre, the Crusade was a whirlwind of strategic maneuvering and military prowess. The road to Jerusalem, fraught with challenges, revealed the fortitude of the Crusaders. Yet, it was the end of the Crusade that truly altered the course of history. Despite not recapturing Jerusalem, the Crusaders regained crucial territories, marking a significant shift in power dynamics. The reverberations of the Third Crusade extended far beyond the battlefield. It influenced diplomatic relations, fostered cultural exchange, and shaped the geopolitical landscape. It was more than just a religious war, it was a defining chapter in human history, and thus the echoes of the Third Crusade resonate through time, reminding us of a tumultuous period in our shared history.